In this video, we will discuss the autobiographical poem An Introduction by Kamla Das. The poem An Introduction expresses how she looks at herself and her outlook on various issues. After reading the poem, you will get an idea of what kind of person she is. You will realize that she is a maverick who doesn't like patriarchy to confine her. Being in unconfirmed, she observes that from domestic space to the political sphere, gender bias is apparent. Therefore, while starting the poem and introduction, she begins with politics, a domain where male figures rule predominantly. The poet says that she knows politics but only the names. She is not aware of the power structure of Indian politics. The poet can only repeat the names of politicians like days of week or names of months as days of week or names of months are repetitive. Similarly, the names of those in power are the same. All are men. Nero is one of them. At the time of publication of the anthology, Summer in Calcutta, 1965, most women were far away from this power game. Surprisingly, after one year, Indira Gandhi became the first female Prime Minister in India. Before Indira Gandhi, women like Sarutini Naidu also took part in Indian politics. However, we will regard it as exceptional case since they belong to the upper class. Women's participation in Indian political parties was low. However, in the case of Assam, it was a little different. In state, patriarchy and women in medieval Assam, Swarnalata Bharadwa points out, some women served the royal court as a nurse and sometimes they played an important role in state politics. In this case, women's participation in politics is comparatively better than other parts of India. However, the patriarchal structure gradually became the cause of the deprivation of women from power politics and decision-making bodies in Assam. In fact, during pre-independence, women took part in politics, but men did not allow women to participate in the decision-making bodies. There was little space for women. In this synopsis, that is done with a special reference to Thane district, the scholar asserts that though there was a reservation policy, the male members of their respective family still interfere in their duties as Mansai leaders. You can further study this by observing your district. Since there is little space in politics for women, she diverts herself from it to her personal life. She proudly introduces herself as a brown Indian. The way she proudly tells the readers about her color is appreciable. We often see Indian people feel ashamed of their identity, their look, and try to imitate the white. As a result, they end up becoming mimic men. Unlike them, Das feels proud that she is an Indian who was born in Malagar. She speaks three languages, Malayalam, English, and Hindi. On top of that, she writes in two languages, Malayalam and English. As we know, besides English, Das also writes in her mother tongue, Malayalam. Apart from speaking and writing, for dreaming, she says she dreams in one language. She might refer to her mother tongue or she might not refer to it. A dream is itself a language where the unconscious thoughts, desires, wishes, etc. are conveyed uniquely. Unlike other languages, it does not stick to rules. She might also mean she sees dreams in her unique language. From her brief introduction, she might attempt to show her proficiency in speaking and writing. Being a common Indian woman of the 1960s, she is competent enough to compete with a man. By claiming her capabilities, she might mean she is equal to any skillful man. Since she writes in English along with Malayalam, her critics, friends and cousins forbid her. They say, Don't write in English. English is not her language. It is the language of the white. In response, she wants them to leave her alone and ask them not to stop her from expressing herself. She also asks them to let her speak any language she likes. She doesn't want to follow what they think is right, rather, what she thinks is right for her emotions and situations. We can discuss her advocacy for the English language from a post-colonial perspective. 
In brief, in post-colonial literary criticism, we discuss how the English language, English literature, etc. become a tool of dominance and oppression. I will discuss this in the future. Don't worry about it. Just keep this in mind. For the time being, many writers and critics don't prefer to use English. On the other hand, some oppose the view. According to the poet, though she writes in English, it is no more a foreign language. The moment she uses it, it becomes her. It includes queerness and distortion. She uses queerness and distortions with positive connotations. The queerness probably refers to the local idioms, terms, and cultural reference, and distortion might mean the hybridized Indian English terms. She believes English has to be acclimatized to suit the Indian experiences. Therefore, adding the native flavor to the foreign language will make it half English, half Indian. Shalman Razdi has called the mixing of half English and half Indian shatnification. It might sound funny to someone, but it is honest. Her language is honest because those queer and distorted Indian English words perfectly reflect her thoughts, feelings, and emotions. We can't find those words in the English language. She uses only those words which suit her experiences. It becomes her since it talks about her experience. Her view on using a foreign language is similar to some post-colonial writers such as R.K. Narayan. In this context, Alk Bomer in Colonial and Post-Colonial Literature states that Kamnada shares the same view what R.K. Narayan considers English a complete Swadeshi language. Furthermore, she says her language is as human as she is. The language is as real as she is. It expresses her joys, yearnings, and hopes. It is as useful to her as cawing is to crows or roaring to the lions. When crows go and lions roar, they produce sounds to express themselves. Similarly, her language is useful for her to express herself. Language helps to express joys, sadness, yearnings, hopes, etc. Her language is the speech of the mind. It comes directly from her awakening mind that can see, hear, and respond to the external world. It is not outside, rather it is inside. Her language is an integral part of herself. She further differentiates between language and sound. We do not consider the mere production of sounds as language. The sounds that trees in a storm are monsoon clouds or rain or the funeral fire produce are not language. The reason is they don't produce sounds consciously. Language is a conscious effort of a living being. Unlike conscious living beings, they don't produce sound to fulfill their desire to express themselves. As she talks about expressing herself, she frankly expresses what it feels to be grown up. As she is in adolescence, changes in the body are apparent. The agents of patriarchy remind her that she is growing. Their statement implies that changes in a woman's body are the harbinger of womanhood. Society commonly associates physical growth with marriage and motherhood. However, apart from the bodily changes, a girl also undergoes a psychological transformation. But this is no concern of the agents of patriarchy. Society values a woman's life based on her ability to procreate. But what if she doesn't possess the ability? Won't she be a woman? Buchi Amachita has beautifully addressed these questions and the idea of motherhood in The Joys of Motherhood. Read the novel when you have free time. So society values a woman's identity based on her external qualities, not internal qualities like love, compassion, etc. In the poet's cage, during the change of physical and psychological change, she needed love, care, and support. She needed love, not knowing what else she could expect from her life. Instead of giving encouragement to achieve possibilities in life, her family gave her one of the weak responsibilities of life, marriage. Then she says, he drew a youth of 16 into the bedroom and closed the door. 
we can understand this line with the help of her autobiography. In her autobiography, My Story thus mentions she was just 15 at the time of marriage. She was not prepared for a big event like marriage. She says, I was a burden and a responsibility. Neither my parents nor my grandmother could put up with for long. Her family arranged her marriage without her consent. So the above lines imply the hastiness of her family's decision. It was her parents and relatives who decided her future and she had no role in taking the major decision of her life. With everyone's approval, they fixed her marriage with a distant relative who worked at a reserve bank in Mumbai. Her marriage took a toll on her life. It was a nightmare. Her lecherous workaholic husband cared little about her. He never thought of starting a conversation with her except the only topic of conversation, sex, that gave him delight. Because of the void of emotion between them, there was only lust in the love making. Thus tells frankly in her autobiography about her wedding night. Her husband fell on her without her awareness and surprised her by the extreme brutality of the attack. She writes, the rape was unsuccessful. However, again and again, throughout that unhappy night, he hurt me, and all the while the catechically drums shoved dully against our window, and the singer sang of the Mayantis flight in the jungle. We observe a reference to her pathetic married life in poems like My Grandmother's House and A Heart Known in Malabar. The last behavior of the husband continued. She keeps trying to pacify her husband by letting him take her body every night, hoping that the act would relax his nerves and make him tranquil. But it turns out futile. Moreover, the inclination of her husband toward his old friend for comfort made her confused. She mentions while celebrating one of her birthdays, they kept her out of the bedroom and locked themselves in. It startled her. The series of incidents gradually made her feel disgusted with her womanliness. Therefore, the two symbols of womanhood, breast and womb, become the reasons of her distress. Her own body becomes the site of her husband's oppression. She says, sadly in her autobiography, The weight of my breast seemed to be crushing me. My private part was only a wound, the soul's wound showing through. As a reaction, she openly rejects her womanliness by wearing a shirt, putting on her brother's trousers, and cutting her hair short. She rejects her identity as a woman in a patriarchal society. Though in a sheer disgust she rejects her womanliness, society prohibits her to follow that way. Seeing her open rejection, the agents of patriarchy come forward to remind her roles in society. They say, Dress in saris, be girl, be wife. They ask her to stick to the roles that a woman is supposed to follow within her house. She could be an embroiderer, a cook, or a quarreler with servants. Such gender roles are predefined and it has been continuing for centuries. The agents of patriarchy impose certain roles on a woman and expect her to follow the predefined roles. The role of a woman, wife, mother, etc. is not natural, rather they are socially constructed. When a woman, like the poet, tries to reject such roles, the categorizers remind her roles in the house. The agents of patriarchy who divide groups like men and women ask her to fit in within the domestic space. The categorizers keep imposing baggage of instruction on her. All the instructions have one common word and that is don't. For instance, they say, Don't sit on walls or peeping through our lace draped windows. So they instruct her not to sit on walls. They forbid her not to intervene in others' life, but to be meek and silent. Interestingly, she can intrude into others' life, but they can have opinions of her and intrude into her life. This is the hypocrisy of the agents of patriarchy. She can be Amy or be Kamala 
or better still the Madhavikutti. It is better to remain as Madhavikutti, her pseudonym. If she writes under a pseudonym, it is suitable for her family and relatives. They don't want to associate with her for various reasons. If she writes frankly about something related to her life, it might go against their principles and they might become a subject of criticism. They are always afraid of criticism and public reaction. This is one of the reasons why the other women writers such as Andre Norton, the Bronte sisters, George Eliot choose a parent name. They confine her not only to the creative domain but also to expressing her emotions. They also say, Don't play pretending games. Don't play at schizophrenia or via nympho. Don't cry embarrassingly loud when silted in love. They forbid her not to play pretending games. To them, schizophrenia, where one undergoes a mental disorder, might be a game on her part. They think she can pretend like a schizophrenic just to get care and love from others. She also should not be a nympho. A nympho is a woman who has a strong sexual appetite and who is sexually attracted to many men. Being a nympho implies breaking all the norms of good behavior in society. Therefore, they can't let her be a nympho. Moreover, she should not cry loud when she is rejected in love. That means she should suppress her emotions. She is not supposed to express her emotion openly. As she talks about love, she goes on to talk about her love for a person. As you already know, her married life is pathetic, so she started to find love outside the sphere of marriage. She says that she has loved him. The man is a universal man who wants a woman. Like him, she is also like every woman who seeks love. She becomes representative of all women because she openly expresses the need of every woman. Every woman seeks love in life. The phrases, the hungry haste of rivers and the ocean's tireless waiting refer to the states of both man and woman in love and she identifies her relationship with every person. Man is in a hurry to quench his thirst whereas a woman, like an ocean, patiently waits for love. During her quest for love, she asks each man his identity. Every man tells that he is I. The one who calls himself I is tightly packed like the sword in its sheath. Here she uses a simile. Just like a sword is hidden inside its sheath, similarly, every man's dormant capabilities remain inside. His actual capabilities are hidden inside, the capability of loving and hurting someone. Here she plays with the pronoun I, and I is identified with different women's experiences. It is I who is in distress and drinks at midnight at hotels in unfamiliar towns. It is I who loves, makes love, and later feels ashamed. She becomes a subject of criticism for openly expressing her sexuality. It is I who lies dying with a rattle in the throat. So she is trying to associate herself with all the women who are having different experiences in life. The poet also says that she is a sinner since she has trespassed against social norms and expressed her sexuality. At the same time, she is also a saint because she suffers and becomes a source of inspiration for other women by expressing herself. She has experienced both the love and also the rejection in love. She identifies with all human beings by saying that she has the same joy, sorrow, desire, fear, love, etc. that a fellow person experiences. She is just like any other human being. Therefore, she can also call herself I because she is not different from any other human being. By playing with the pronoun I, she asks everyone not to judge her from a different perspective but rather to treat her equally. This is how she tactfully asserts her identity that is equal to any person. So till now we have discussed the following points, politics, self-introduction, then language, adolescence, married life, revolt against norms, the quest for love and I. For the team, visit the vlog, the link is in the description below. Thank you for your time and patience.